you all very much. And we do look forward to that day. I, I invite you to open up with me in your Bible to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2, as we're going to complete Ruth chapter 2 this morning. Uh, I'm so uh, excited about the message this morning. Uh, and, and to truth be told, I'm not always excited about the messages that I preach. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there we go. And I don't know, there's some other preachers and retired pastors. I need to ask someone if that's normal. It may just be something with me. But this one is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, I think, in part because of, of the richness of what we see. You know, when we started this series, I said that Ruth is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. And as uh, I've gone through and studied it a little bit more, even uh, through this sermon series, that's just, it just reaffirms something in my heart. Because there is a beauty uh, in this text. It's such a short story, and yet embedded in the story are so many things and so many beautiful traits that we see portrayed among the people, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz that I believe are reflective of the heart of God. And as we think of the Old Testament especially, as we read the Old Testament, sometimes we wonder, what what do we do with it? There's all kinds of of stories, and some of them are amazing. You see these powerful miracles of God. Some of them are are kind of confusing. What does it mean that Elijah smacks the the river and an axe head floats? And, And some of them are just confounding. But what I love about the Old Testament is that there's, there's this uh, there's need to dig deep. You don't get this, this nice placard-like sticker tape verse that you can just take away. You've got to look at the stories and you've got to dig deep to try and understand, God, what are you trying to communicate? What are you trying to say? And I think as we look at this story particularly, as we think about Naomi, as we think about Ruth, as we think about Boaz, as we think about the context in which they came, there's this sense in which you have Naomi who's brokenhearted, you've got Ruth who's incredibly loyal, and then you have this man Boaz who is kind of, kind of just an older man who comes on the scene, and yet what we're going to see in the text today is that Boaz's heart over time has been forged for a love for God. And that Boaz, as we're going to see in the text today, has this this sense of faithfulness, has this sense of love and generosity and kindness, that as I look at Boaz, here's the determination that I've come to as I read Ruth over and over again, I want to be like Boaz when I grow up. He is the kind of man that I want to aspire to be like, not because he's perfect, but because there's something about him that reflects the heart of God. And uh, as you think about your life, I want you to to think for a moment about someone that you say is is a godly example, someone that that you aspire to be like. And of course, I say that about growing up tongue-in-cheek, but I I just want you to think for a moment. You know, I love getting to sit down and have conversations with people where they will tell me, this person was a mentor to me, or this person was a model for me. And sometimes it even looks like this, that the people who are models are people that, that they didn't even know uh, people were watching them, but I looked at this person, I saw this person, I saw the way they behaved, I saw the way they carried themselves, I saw their faithfulness, their kindness, and it had an incredible impact. Do you have anyone in your life like that, that you just look at them and you think, man... They reflect the heart of God. You know, it's interesting, and and my grandma happens to be here today, so this is somewhat of a coincidence, and this is the peril of preaching and pastoring in your own town. I'm going to brag on my grandma for a minute, not knowing that she was going to be here, because my grandma, to me, is one of those people. Uh, my grandma has a heart of wisdom, but she has a very kind heart as well. And it was funny, I was, uh, I was at church one day, and, and a, a very gruff man kind of came up to me, and he said, Tim, I want to tell you something. Oh, okay, well, uh, you never know where that conversation's going to go, but let's go, all right? And uh, he says, I want, to, I, want to tell you, I want to tell you something about your grandma, Tim. Oh, okay. Uh, he says, you know, when I was about 10 years old, your grandma had a store downtown. The name of the store was Hayden's. He said, I went into Hayden's. My dad sent me in there with half as much money as I needed. And he said, go buy a dress for your mom. And so I, he said, I went in there. I was 10 years old. He said, I was scared to death. I went in there. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to get. And he said, I walk in there. And as a 10-year-old, there were workers looking at me like, what on earth is this 10-year-old doing in a woman's clothing store? And he said, but Tim, I'm telling you something. Your grandma came up to me. And she treated me like I was a millionaire. And she took me around, and he said, I didn't have enough money to pay for it. And she boxed it up. She gave it to me and said, you take that home, and when your dad can, have him send in the rest of the money. And he said, Tim, I'm not so sure about your grandpa, but I love your grandma, and I always will. (laughs) 
And I said, hey, praise God. You know, I mean, those are the kind of things that, that I look at that and I think, man, alive. This, that, what a legacy, you know, for someone to be able to, to, to say, look at this person. And so as I think about my life, there are many people, and I could point to many people, but, but there are people who just stand out. And as you look at their life, you look at them and say, there's something to emulate. There's something to imitate. There's something that they show. And here's what I believe. It has nothing to do with them. It's the goodness of God over time that is at work in their lives. So that when you're around certain people, you just sense their, the, the presence of God. You sense the joy of their continued obedience. And, and for me, I love looking at people. I love being around people like that. I'm so thankful I have people who have poured into my life for many years like that. But as I look at Boaz, I love Boaz because he was one of those people. And we've said this over and over again that the Bible talks about the time of the judges as being a time where every man did what was right in his own eyes. This was a time when there, there wasn't any legal standard to hold people to. There wasn't a king who could come punish you. It was left to each person to follow God based on the dictates of their own conscience. And it's in this Malayu, it's in this context that Boaz, is a, uh, Boaz arises as a model for us to follow. And so here's, here's how we uh, jumped in the text last week. We looked at this idea of Ruth, the Moabite, coming into the land of Israel. And she's a foreigner. And when people looked at her, that was the first thing they saw. But Boaz, Boaz was different. When he saw Ruth, he didn't see a foreigner. He didn't see someone who he could exploit or take advantage of. No, he saw this woman who he knew needed help. And he saw that he had the resources, ability, and opportunity to come in and help her. And so he dignified her in this amazing way. He told the young men who were in his field, he said, don't harm this woman, but let her stay here. And in that moment, Ruth comes and bows down at his feet. And she asks him, why have you looked with such favor on me even though I'm a foreigner? At which point Boaz says, I, I've seen what you've done. I know the faithfulness that you've shown to Naomi and to your family. And I know that you've come from a foreign nation. And he says this, may God bless you under whose wings you have come for, sh for shelter and refuge. Boaz looked with different vision. He wasn't like the other men of his day. And he proved that by the way that he treated this young Moabite named Ruth. And today, we're going to look at the second half of that story, kind of the Paul Harvey rest of the story. We're going to look at the second half of that text, starting in verse 14 of chapter 2, and how Boaz continues, not just showing this initial kindness, not just reaching out with a nice gesture, but continues to show this woman, Ruth, honor and dignity, and he shows great generosity in, in, an, in, an, in an amazing way that we're going to read, and hopefully, I pray that the Lord is going to use this to really bring a sense of wanting to emul emulate and imitate Boaz this morning. So what I want to do is start there in verse 14. We're picking this up. It's the same day that Ruth is working in the field. She's been there all day, and it says in verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz told her, come over here and have some bread and dip it in the vinegar. So she sat beside the harvesters, and he offered her roasted grain. And she ate and was satisfied and had some left over. And when she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather even among the bundles, and don't humiliate her. Pull out some stalks from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. Don't rebuke her. And so Ruth gathered grain into the, in the field until evening, and she beat out what she had gathered, and it was about 26 quarts of barley. She picked up the grain and went into town where her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought out what she had left over from her meal and gave it to her. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you gather barley today? And where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who took notice of you. And Ruth told her mother-in-law, whom she had worked with, and said, The name of the man I work with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May the Lord bless him. Because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. And Naomi continued, the man is a close relative. He is one of our family redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, he also told me, stay with my young men until they have finished all of my harvest. So Naomi said to her daughter-in-law Ruth, my daughter, it's good for you to work with his female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. And Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So the, the rest of this day is very interesting in terms of Ruth working. And remember that she's working all day long in the field. She'd only took one small break, 
And we need to remind ourselves the reason for this. It's because she was destitute. It's because she was impoverished. She was literally working in order to survive, picking up the scraps left behind by the harvesters so that she could take it home to Naomi and they could at least eke by this bare bones existence. And yet here's what Boaz does. He knows what she's doing. He sees her hard work. He sees her faithfulness. And here's what he says. He says, Ruth, come and sit with me. Now, I I want you to think back for a moment. You remember the the times in in junior high or high school whenever you had to pick a, a table to sit out at the lunchroom? Right? I mean, this was a traumatizing experience for some, especially when you're walking around. It's like, do I have a group of friends? Are they going to invite me to sit with them? And of course, we can kind of laugh and say, well, yeah, that's kind of junior high lunchroom. But the, the reality is, it matters to that junior high kid or to that high school student. It matters, and here's why. Not because it matters where I consume my meal, but it matters whether or not I belong. And that's what's going on here. Think about this. It's, it says and it implies that Ruth, when everyone else took a break to go eat, Ruth was not invited. And maybe this was kind of her own self-perception. She knew she was not one of them. She knew she wasn't a worker. She knew that that food was not prepared for her. And so she goes off on her own. And listen, from what it says in the text, she didn't have food to eat. She didn't bring her lunch. She went off on her own until... Boaz took the time to invite her to the table. Now, here's an interesting aspect of the Bible that's very easy for us to miss as Westerners. It's the idea of honor. It's the idea of station in life. It's the idea that whenever Boaz invites Ruth to come eat a meal with him, he is essentially saying, I am bestowing upon you an honor. And I want you to think about this for a moment. When it comes to Jesus and his ministry, Jesus got in trouble all the time in terms of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders. He got in trouble all the time because of who he chose to eat with. I can't believe that you're eating with Zacchaeus. Or I can't believe that you're eating with these sinners. And the idea was this, that these were dishonorable people. They were sinners. They were poor. And the Pharisees could not believe that Jesus was willing to stoop down beneath his station, to stoop down beneath the honor of a rabbi and to eat with the rabble. And yet, here's what I love about Boaz. Boaz, who is a wealthy man. Boaz, who has honor in his community. He looks at this woman who is a foreigner. He looks at this woman who is poor. He looks at this woman, and don't miss this, who has absolutely nothing that she can offer him in return. And he says, come come and eat at my table. And for Ruth, it is impossible to overestimate the difference that made in her life. Have you ever been in a moment where you felt undignified or where you weren't worth somebody's time? I can think of no worse feeling than that. When someone looks at you or treats you like trash, looks at you and treats you like you don't matter, that is one of the worst possible human feelings. Why? Because none of us wants to be humiliated. None of us wants to be publicly reproached. But imagine the, the, the kind of rapture that would have happened as Ruth is going off. She doesn't have food to eat. I mean, just think of even that from the human perspective. If she's been working all day, she's got to be hungry. She goes to see all of these people sit alone at a table, and she has nothing to eat. Think of what it would have meant to her for Boaz to say, come here. And Jesus told a parable about this. It's very interesting. As he was eating with the Pharisees, he said this, whenever you go to a party or whenever you go to a place, don't automatically assume that you're going to have the most honored seat in the room. Don't automatically assume that people are going to look at you and, and look at you with respect. And said, he, he said, take the lowest seat. That way, when the leader of the party comes in, they can come and they can move you up if they, if, if they want to. But don't assume you've got greater honor than you do. And this is what I love about Boaz. Boaz was a man who had great honor and great esteem. And yet, he wasn't afraid to use that honor to lift up someone in a low station. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 6. This is Paul speaking of the same thing among Christians, that we are called to live in harmony with one another. And he says this, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position and do not be conceited. It's very interesting to me. Uh, I I read a book, this was many, many years ago, uh, called 
I can't even remember what it was called. My goodness, talk about losing your train of thought. No, this is what it was called. It was called The Millionaire Next Door. There it is. I knew it was there. It's a book called The Millionaire Next Door. And in this book, it was very interesting because the whole premise of the book was that, that they surveyed like a thousand millionaires and they tried to kind of, you know, tabulate what are the practices and different things of millionaires that kind of get them to be there. And here's what they said, that the amazing thing is this, that if you, are, if you were to meet a millionaire, and they define this as someone whose net worth was over a million dollars, okay, if you were to meet a millionaire, here's what they said, it's almost for sure that you wouldn't know you were meeting them. Because the people who truly have money are people who don't flaunt it. They're not the people driving around in the nice brand new latest year model car. They're the people who are driving the old junkers. They're the people who are not wearing the most expensive clothes. They're the people who instead of spending money are people who save money. And of course, when you start to think about that, it makes sense. But here's, here's kind of the point. A lot of times when we look at people, if you're like me, this is, this is something that I think it's human to do. We, we like to kind of, you know, size people up almost immediately, don't we? I mean, we look at people and you make assumptions about them. You make assumptions about what social class they are. Maybe you make assumptions about what political party they are. Or you make assumptions about people, and here's what this book was saying, that that's almost entirely wrong. And I've, I've heard stories of this from businessmen. I've heard stories of businessmen saying that, you know, someone would come in and be kind of like, you know, your classic Laclede County farm boy, come in in overalls, and you're kind of thinking, man, uh, you know, are they, are they going to buy something or what's going to come? And he said, you know, they buy this, this incredibly expensive item or piece of merchandise, and what do they do? They come up, pay for it in cash. And here's the point. You don't know. You never know. In fact, it says in Hebrews, it says this, always be hospitable because people have entertained angels without even knowing it. And here's the truth. The Bible says that every single person, no matter whether they have wealth or whether they don't, is made in the image of God, is infinitely valuable in God's eyes. So when Paul comes along and he says this, he's reflecting this heart that Boaz shows. Don't be proud, but will be willing to associate with people of low position. In other words, don't look at what people you think can do for you. Don't look, at, don't look at the perceived advantage that it's going to give to you. Treat people with dignity. Treat people with respect. Pe- treat people with honor, knowing that God is the one who made them. And as we look at this, I, I want to look specifically at what Boaz says. He says, come here, have some bread, dip it in the sauce. In other words, come eat at my table, and we're going to share the same food together. You know, I love eating meals with people, and I particularly love eating meals with people in their home because that's when you get to know someone, right? I mean, let's be honest. You come to church, we get to say hi, bye, and we get to get to know people a little bit, but I'm telling you, over and over again, as I've met with people in their homes, if I, as I've got to share a meal with them, you get to see a different side of them. When you put someone in their own context, in their own kind of wheelhouse, you get to see how they really are. And it's interesting because when we come together around a meal, there's a sense of fellowship right? There's a sense of, of camaraderie. We're all hungry. We're all eating the same thing. And Boaz is inviting Ruth into that. It says, she sat beside the harvesters and he offered her roasted grain. Now look with me at the next line because this is going to become important. It says that she ate and was satisfied and had some left over. So Ruth takes, she eats this meal, she's satisfied, but she has some left over. And we're going to look later in the text at what those leftovers mean and what she does with those. But let's keep reading. It says, when she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather even grain among the bundles. And look at what he says, and don't humiliate her. You see, Boaz understood something. And this word humiliate, we're going to talk about in just a minute. But he understood that these young men, as they looked at Ruth, they looked at Ruth as fresh meat. I mean, here's someone, again, who has no protector. She has no father who's going to come in and save her. She has no husband who's going to come in and defend her. These young men looked at Ruth. They knew who she was, and yet Boaz comes in, and he says, listen, don't humiliate her. And the word humiliate can mean one of two different things, or maybe both at the same time. It could mean don't physically harm her, but it also could mean don't speak derisively about her. So Boaz looks at them, and he's basically saying, listen, I know what it's like to be a young man. I know how you think. I know how you talk. But do not humiliate her. She knows she's in a low position. She knows she's impoverished. She doesn't need you calling her names. She doesn't need you catcalling her. She doesn't need you treating her derisively. No, don't humiliate her. 
even though, listen, she was in the lowest possible position that a person could be in at that time. He warns those young men, don't do it. And I can't help but think of the call of God over and over again through the Scriptures. When it comes to those who are poor, he says, listen, don't look down on them. When it comes to the orphan and the widow, don't deride them simply because they have no one who can protect them. But instead, look at what Boaz does. He says, don't rebuke her, don't humiliate her, but pull out some stalks from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. Now, I want us to think about that for a moment. I've already told you uh, that the laws of this time were, were simply this. As people glean the harvest, they would go through and they would harvest, and every once in a while, as they're harvesting the grain or they're harvesting whatever it is that they're harvesting, something would drop to the ground. These kind of scraps are left over. Someone accidentally drops it, and here's what the law said, that when a person does this, that you were not to pick it up and put it back and wash it off. No, it says that when you drop something, you are to leave that for the poor. Leave that for those who don't own a field. Leave that for those who don't have enough for themselves. Leave it for them so that when they come along, they will have something to eat. That was the law. And this law, by the way, was given so that everyone in Israel, even those who were poor, who would, ha- would have at least something enough to survive. So Boaz, think of what Boaz could have done. He could have easily said to these workers, listen, whenever she comes to pick up the scraps, don't say anything to her. Because after all, again, every man did what was right in his own eyes. There was no guarantee that these harvesters wouldn't just reach down and pick it up. Boaz could have said, well, the law says to do it, and so I'm going by the letter of the law. But notice that's not what he does. And this is what I love about Boaz, because he demonstrates here an above and beyond generosity. He's already demonstrated his kindness to Ruth by inviting her up to his social class, up to his social circle, up to his table. But it's not just kindness. He shows this incredible generosity. You see, he says to his workers, he says, whenever you're gleaning, don't just leave behind scraps, but actually drop something behind for her. At which point these workers were probably like, Boaz, what did you say? I mean, you do know that this is a business, right? You do know that we're here to make a dollar. You do know that we're, we've got mouths to feed. Did I really just hear you say that we're supposed to drop this perfectly good, brand new, freshly harvested grain for this Moabite woman? At which point Boaz says, you heard me right. It's my field. Go leave her some stuff behind. And this is, this is an above and beyond generosity that I think gets to, to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9 when he says, God loves a cheerful giver. Here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 7. I love this. The verse says this, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they've done. When Boaz looked at Ruth, he recognized, I have an overabundance. I have more than I need. And because of that, God has given me this opportunity to be kind to someone. And again, was there any return on this investment? No. Was he trying to do this to impress somebody? No. Was he giving so that his name would appear on the side of a building? No. He simply said, here is a woman who is in need. I have something that I can do about it. So I'm going to go listen above and beyond the requirements of the law. And out of a generous heart, I'm going to give freely. And this is what I love about Boaz, because Boaz doesn't do it grudgingly or reluctantly. He saw the need, and from the joy that God had given him, he said, God has blessed me, and therefore I will be a blessing. And so what does it say? Verse 17, Ruth gathered grain in the field until evening They left behind this food for her, and so she beat out what she had gathered, and it was about 26 quarts of barley. This was enough food to last her and Naomi for weeks. And and I can't help but wonder, what was it like to be Ruth? I mean, Ruth, remember, she's, she's staying behind, she's working, trying to look for scraps, trying to wait for just somebody to, to drop a little bit of something. Is there enough food so I can bring it home so that we don't starve? What was her thought? whenever this person came and dropped that first full stock. I wonder if she thought, man, was this a mistake? Like, what's going on here? But what was her thought whenever they kept coming and kept coming and kept coming? And here's what I love. Notice with me what Boaz had said in verse 12. 
He says, may the Lord reward you for what you've done and may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Boaz prayed for something to happen and then here's the deal. He was willing to be the vessel through which that prayer was fulfilled. And I love that because some people want to kind of claim to be generous. Yeah, Lord, use me for whatever you want to use me for. But Boaz doesn't just pray it. Boaz says, God, will you please bless this woman and my workers leave out some bundles so she can take them home. Boaz is willing to be a vessel in the hand of God. He's willing to be used by God in this incredibly generous way. He goes above and beyond. And you know, it's very interesting, when when it comes to generosity, generosity is something that leads to incredible joy. And this is is the kind of interesting thing, when it comes to, to pastoring, here's what I know, that people are very sensitive a lot of times when you talk about money. But when it comes to money, the Bible says very clearly, money is one of the best reflections of our heart. Money is one of the best reflections of our obedience Because money is something that's incredibly valuable to us. And yet, here's what I love about the generosity of Boaz. Boaz was willing to look past what it cost him. And he was willing to look toward the benefit that it would give to Ruth. I think of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 when he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourself. Proverbs says, if you lend to the poor, you're lending to the Lord, and the Lord will repay you. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It's the same principle. Talking about giving, he says this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And don't you love that language of sowing and reaping? It's the exact same thing. Why is it that God was blessing Boaz? I believe that it was because in the midst of a dark time, he was a shining light. And here's what God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here's the interesting thing. When it comes to tithing, there's, there's a whole debate as to whether New Testament believers are still under the command to tithe. And here's the interesting thing about the Old Testament tithing system, that there were three separate tithes. The first tithe was meant to pay for the Levites because they had no land. A tenth of your income would go to the Levites immediately. There was another tithe that was a tithe of the festivals, that another 10% of your income after that first 10% would go to basically having a giant party where you were called to celebrate before the Lord all that he had given you. There was a third tithe that happened every third year that you were to give another tenth to the poor so that they would have enough to live on every three years. So when it came to the Old Testament tithing system, and I don't know that I've ever heard this preached, but the reality is the Old Testament tithing system, if you add up the income, it would have been about 23.3% of your total annual income that you were required to get. Just let that settle in for a minute, all right? You're getting away with 10%, okay? 23.3%. And I want you to think of it in this context. Boaz was faithful. We have every reason to believe that Boaz was already putting one out of every four cents that he had and giving that to God. And yet still, he didn't say, oh God, you've already got one out of four. I better keep the rest. No, he was looking for ways to bless He was looking for ways to be generous, apparently because he was so overwhelmed with the generosity of God in his life. At which point God says, listen, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Because God loves a cheerful giver. When it comes to giving, people have different opinions. You know, I've heard people, I've shared this before, some people look at giving to a church like taxes, right? Oh, that 10%. They're never getting it from me. Oh, I'm a, you know, I'm going to give eight and then mm, stick it to the pastor because he didn't, you know, he didn't shake hands with me last Sunday. It's like, if that's you, that's fine. I don't know what you give, so joke's on you, brother. <laughs> but the whole point of giving is not God says to do it, therefore I'm going to... Grunt my teeth and bear. No, the whole point is God has blessed me. 
And I want to look to be a blessing. And here's the thing that I know. Here's the thing that I see. And here's why I said I'm excited to preach this message. is because I know people who are generous are the people who have the most joy in their lives. People who live open-handed are the kind of people that God continues to bless. Not with incredible riches, but he continues to bless them in terms of there being fullness in their lives. God loves a cheerful giver. And the Bible says over and over, listen, if you give, I will bless And listen, I'm a believer in giving to the local church. I believe that that should be first and foremost in all of our priorities in terms of giving. But here's what I believe. I believe that giving to the local church is the training wheels of generosity, not the end goal. And, and, you know, here's here's kind of, and I I feel like it's important to, to share this, not because of, any other reason except I want you to know that, that when it comes to giving, even in the Old Testament, you know, it's interesting. The Levites, they got the first tenth from the people of Israel. But did you know the Levites were required to tithe themselves? There's a specific law of tithing for them. And I want you to know, as a pastor, here's what Melissa and I do. We sit down and we take that first tenth of our income and we say, that's going to the church. Then we look at that and we say, okay, what other things? We, we set an amount every single month to pay off the building loan that we have. We go after that and say, what are some things that draw near and dear to our hearts that God has, has put on our hearts? And we try to give generously. And here's the amazing thing. Here's what I love. I love it whenever God puts something on our heart. And there's something, maybe it's a missionary who comes through and it's just like, oh my goodness, I want to take part. I want to invest in that. Or maybe God puts someone, this happened a couple of years ago, uh, someone in our connect group, man, they've got a real need. Listen, when you live generously, when you live open-handed, you can look at those as opportunities to say, God, where can I invest? Where are you moving? Where are you working? Where can I join you and give generously? And listen, the blessing is always going to come back on you. And that's what the Bible says over and over and over again. I mean, think of the verse that says, God owns the the cattle on a thousand hills. Listen, if God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he can spare one or two for you. And here's what I'm reminded of what it says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 through 19. Here's what it says. This is Paul writing to Timothy, but he's writing to the church as well. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But to put their hope, I missed an E there, put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In other words, everything comes from God, therefore we are to live open-handedly with everything we have. And then he says this, I love this, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. You want to look at someone who's free? I'll show you a generous person and I'll show you a person who's free. And this is what I love about Boaz, is Boaz said, listen, I know it's the beginning of the harvest. Take some of those bundles and just give them to Ruth. Didn't make any sense except that he wanted to give. But here's what I love, and this this right here is why Ruth is my favorite book. Not specifically, but these kind of things that just pop up over and over. Because here's what we see. It says in verse 18, she picked up the grain. This is Ruth. Went into town where her mother-in-law saw what she'd gleaned. And then look at this. She brought out what she had left over from her meal, and she gave it to her mother-in-law. Here's something you need to know about generosity. Generosity is not about an amount. It's about an attitude of the heart. You see, Ruth was just as generous. She had been given this meal, and you know what she said? I'm not going to eat all of it. I'm going to save some so I can take it home to my mother-in-law, who, by the way, has had nothing to eat today. So whether or not you're a millionaire or whether or not you've got a million pennies, the reality is every single one of us can be generous. Ruth, literally all she had was half a meal, but she said, I'm going to give this half a meal to my mother-in-law who has nothing. And when God looks at our heart, he's not looking at the amount. He's looking and saying, are you a cheerful giver? Are you giving generously? Yes, are you giving sacrificially? And I love that because Ruth gave all that she had. Boaz wasn't scared of whatever it would cost him monetarily. And when it came to giving, listen, they lived a generous life. And here's the thing. You know, curses do not come with hitches. You cannot take anything with you. And here's what I believe. I truly believe that there are going to be many people who get to heaven and they are going to be disappointed 
Because look at what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. This is the most amazing investment in the world. It's not just that God will bless us on this side of heaven, but the Bible says that when it comes to generosity, God is going to bless us for eternity. That you are putting money into a CD forever that is going to compound and compound and compound, laying up treasure for yourself as a firm foundation for the coming age. And this is what Paul says, command those who are rich in this world. And, and this is what I love. Every once in a while this happens. Someone will come and say, Tim, is there a way that I can go above and beyond, not just giving to the church, but is there a way I can be a blessing? Listen, those are good conversations to have. Because then I can tell them about Tyler and Hannah Wood, who are Ethnos 360 missionaries. We already support them as a church, but they're in the middle of fundraising right now. They're going across the country trying to raise up enough money so that they can come and spend their lives as missionaries training down the road at Roche, Missouri. Or I can tell them about various ministries that we support as a church. Or I can tell them about opportunities to go and give to all kinds. I mean, there's so many things. And listen, it's not just about what a pastor can tell you. Here's what I would advise you to do. Be generous. Give to the church but lay aside something extra. I mean, think about this. Think about the impact that this could have. Just lay aside something extra, maybe every week, maybe every month, so that when the Lord lays something on your heart, a single mom who needs a new car, or the Lord lays something on your heart, a ministry that you see and want to support, or the Lord lays something on your heart. Maybe your grandkid needs a generous gift to get them by. Something the Lord lays on your heart. At that point, you've laid it. You've laid it aside. And at that point, you can give it. And you can have the joy of giving. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes people get antsy about their money. And they'll go out and they'll, they'll buy a new car. And that might stay new for about a month. And you might enjoy it. Or they'll buy a new house. And it might be good for about six months. And you'll enjoy it. And those things are good. Those things are fine. But listen, I have heard people talk about buyer's remorse. I've never heard someone talk about giver's remorse. And the reason for that is because God says, lay up treasure for yourself forever. Don't just spend money for now. Don't just spend it on yourself. And listen, here's, this is my morbid mind, but go with me here. I've been to a lot of funerals. But here's what I want to be true of me. When I die, I want people to be sad. But because of my generosity, I hope there will be some people who smile. And I hope, I mean, even in dying, that when, when everything is said and done, of course, you take care of your family first. The Bible is absolutely clear about that. The person who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. That's what Paul says. But when it comes to generosity, man, make some people happy when you go by what you give away. But maybe even let's take it a step beyond that. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of waiting until you die, what if you were just generous all the way? And here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that many people are going to get to heaven, and one of the things that they're going to regret is not being more generous with all the blessings that God has given them. But one of the things that's on my heart is, it's not going to be because your pastor didn't tell you. And as you think about your life, there are so many incredible things. God is moving in so many ways. Let God lay something on your heart and then live to be a blessing. You can't take it with you, but listen, generosity will resound through the ages. And again, what I love about Boaz, what I love about Ruth, is that neither one of them were looking for recognition. They weren't looking for an award. They were just being generous because they knew the God of Israel under whose wings they had come for refuge. And you know why I think God loves the heart of a cheerful giver? Because a cheerful giver is someone who recognizes that God has given everything to me. And this is why we come always back to the gospel. I love this. Boaz is referred to in this text as a family redeemer. Naomi says, oh my goodness, Ruth, I can't believe you went to Boaz's field. He's blessed you. He showed kindness to the living and the dead. He's a family redeemer. And here's what I love, because the story from this point is just going to fly. It's going to go crazy, and it's going to be awesome. I love the rest of the book of Ruth. But Naomi is so floored, because remember, remember, Naomi up to this point has been heartbroken. 
Naomi up to this point has believed that God forgot about her long ago. She believed that the hand of the Lord was against her. But now, in the face of this incredible generosity of this self-giving love that Boaz shows to Ruth, she cannot deny that God has not forgot about her. And this is the reality for all believers that when it comes to the generosity of God, we have an incredibly generous God who loved us so much that he didn't just give us money, he didn't just give us blessings, he didn't just give us the breath in our lungs, he gave us his only son so that all who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. The blessing of the gospel is something that once you receive it, once you truly receive it, you cannot help but be generous. Because God who gave everything to us, he says, I love you. I love to give. And when you reflect the heart of God, listen, when you reflect the heart of God, you will learn to love to give. It won't be a burden. It won't be a tax. It will be an opportunity for you to show kindness to those who may not deserve it. But did you? Did I? No. But we serve a God who loved us so much that even when we didn't deserve it, he made a way and he gave us everything we needed. And so, when I grow up, I want to be like Boaz because Boaz's heart was the heart of God. Let's pray. Father.